and welcome to In Studio. I'm Emmeline and today my guest is a well-known radio personality in Toronto. He's a fitness fanatic, a comic writer, a podcast host. Please welcome Q107's Fearless Fred Kennedy. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Thanks so much for coming on today. Anytime, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the invite. So because you're here, um, I got out my original soundtrack Star Wars album on vinyl, so I thought I'd put that out. <laughs> Perfect. It makes me feel welcome. I appreciate it. <laughs> so um, you probably don't remember this, but in 2017, my mm -hmm. family got a chorus tour. This is back when you were working at The Edge, and we came through and we met you and we talked to you for a long time. And after um, the person who was giving us the tour, he said to my mom, he's like, I've never seen him talk to anyone that long. And she hasn't dropped it since. She still brings it up. <laughs> I thought that that makes me feel like I'm standoffish. Normally, though, I, I, I brush people out of the studio when I got things to do. But if that was like 2017, I was still on the edge. Like that was like my last six, seven months on the edge. At that point, I was kind of an autopilot. I, I, right. I was the old man on the station then. I was the oldest guy by nine years at that point, which is wild. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you got your nickname, Fearless Fred, back when you were working at Power 97 in Winnipeg. Can yes. you tell us how you got it? <laughs> so by that time, I'd been in radio for like four years and I'd been fired from everywhere that I was working. So I started in the late 90s. And then when I got to Winnipeg, uh, I was doing overnights, but I wasn't even on air for overnights. I was just pushing buttons while playing recorded segments of other people because radio is still like using a lot of CDs back then. So every time the morning show would come in, there are these two guys, BJ and Hal, when they would come in, you, I would pull all the music for them and then pull all the commercial carts. And I would always like ask if they needed anything. I could go get them coffee. I had ideas like, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but this is a pretty big story. And I was always trying to like ingratiate myself to these guys because they were like the kings of the station. They were a heritage morning show. And they gave me a shot to start doing stunts for the show. Uh, and then when the, uh, the, the APD, the assistant program director and music director, Lachlan Cross filled in on mornings, he brought me in to do a bunch of stuff. And when they came back, they're like, well, you sounded good. We'll use you again. And my first stunt for BJ and Hal was I drank a Slurpee at every single 7-Eleven in Winnipeg to celebrate the 75th anniversary of 7-Eleven because most people don't realize this. Winnipeg is the Slurpee capital of the world where they drink more Slurpees in Winnipeg than anywhere else per capita. So I had the special Winnipeg flavor of Slurpee. It has its own flavor called bug juice, by the way. Um, and it's basically just sugar water. But I had one at every 7-Eleven. And I, then they started bringing me on more and more. And I think it was, was it the, I think it was Elvis's birthday or one of the other ones was the very first time that they called me uh, Fearless Fred on the air. And it wasn't something that was planned. It was just something that, Hal Anderson said on the air because I was yeah I think it was the the Elvis Presley thing so I was out front and you could come by and you could buy a donut and the proceeds from buying the donut would go to the the food the food bank or something and if you paid more you could throw the donut at me <laughs> so that's where I I'm pretty sure like when I think about it that I remember it was the first time that they called me Fearless Fred. So yeah, people so. were paying to throw stuff at your, at your face. Yeah, man. It was a different time. You can't do stuff like that anymore. Like, it's, <laughs> it, it just won't let it. Like, it's it honestly is a different time. It was weird because a lot of, the, if I, like, make a list of the things that I had to do, people would be like, they were so cruel to you. And it's like, sort of, but <laughs> also it was because of them that I got ahead they would always make sure, like make sure that I was looked after. So I was getting donuts thrown at me, but if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have got my shot on air because right. they wanted me to be a personality on the station. So I, oh, and I taught, it was like International Radio Day or something like a month ago. And 
I went on a big rant about how much I love BJ and Hal, like, and how I owe them so much. And Hal Anderson still does at radio in Winnipeg. He's, he's <laughs> awesome. He's a it's monster of a guy. He's like, huge. Like in an industry, like, like acting and music and, and broadcasting, you kind of do whatever it takes at the beginning to get. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I think it's because I, I had like unbridled enthusiasm for it, <laughs> that they just kept seeing how far I would go. We did an audition for Canadian Idol. Uh, I, it, it didn't make TV, but I had a water bottle in my pocket with a tube. And so I was wearing gray sweatpants and I pushed it and it squirted water to make it look like I peed myself <laughs> while we were doing the audition. It was awesome. And yeah, these are the t many types of things that I would do for the show. Cause, so me saying Canadian Idol immediately dates it to like 2002. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> Whose idea time. was it to just go on Canadian Idol to? to that was Lachlan. <laughs> that was the APD. I, I when I credit uh, BJ and Hal, I've also got to credit the assistant program director Lachlan Cross, who still is on air. He does mornings at cruise in Edmonton now. And he was a real big cheerleader for me. Like he was really supportive when I was starting out because he would always like throw these ideas that were, he thought were too ridiculous. And I'd be like, no, that's great. Let's do it. <laughs> so yeah, I was a glutton for punishment is what it was. <laughs> that's great. Um, so you're from Nova Scotia and then you moved to Belgium and yeah. then like all around Canada because of your yeah. military family. Yeah, my dad was military. So, and when, when I think about it, like being in the military, like being in a military family mm -hmm. kind of prepared me mentally for moving, sure. which is something you've got to do a lot when you work in broadcasting. Like I have never lived in a place for as long as a period of time continuously as I have in the GTA, like ever in my whole life, like ever, which it's really weird to think about. But yeah, that's just the way it was. So I was thinking about that and I was kind of thinking, especially growing up, moving, that can be, I mean, really lonely and, um, consider chopping out a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that one again. Um, I was thinking, you know, growing up, moving around a lot, that can be really lonely and you're, I mean, on radio where there's music. So what kind of music did you listen to growing up? You know, it's, it's interesting you say that. Um, because when we moved, and, and you can talk to, I guarantee if you talk to a bunch of people that were posted overseas and then came back, like if you're overseas for a long period of time, uh, it's a very different lifestyle, way of living. And then you come back to Canada and you're like 12 and you're just supposed to like acclimatize. And I'm not going to say it's traumatic. I'm just saying it's a big shift. And so I wasn't prepared for going to a school where there was seven or eight people in my grade to going to a school where there was 30 people in my class. And it was a kind of a jarring experience. And I remember listening to the radio constantly in junior high, especially, uh, and when I was in the eighth grade, when the bear launched, the bear was the station in Edmonton that I worked at. And when it launched, it was the only rock station in the city. And what's, when I say rock radio, it sounds differently than it sounded then, because in 1993, we were in the midst of the grunge explosion and they were the only station that was playing it. And you would have like, SDP, Nirvana, Alice in Chains, The Cure, uh, Suicide Machines, I Mother Earth, Moist, and all these bands were at their zenith. Like they were as big as they were going to get. And it was awesome. And because radio had such a stranglehold over the listener at the time, like the shows were bigger. It was, a, it was awesome. And I fell in love with it. Uh, there's this guy, Sled Dog Michaels, who worked at the Bear. And I thought he was the coolest guy ever and I worked with him and I I know he didn't dislike me but I don't think he did like me if you know what I mean and I at the very first like station when I finally had my big comeuppance to me was 
when I started working at the bear in like 2004 and I was doing evenings and I remember at the Christmas party, he said, I listened to you, kid. He goes, you make me laugh and then you make me furious. <laughs> and then I was and in my head, I'm like, that's the best compliment you could give me. That's the best thing you could say. A strong emotional reaction, you know, yeah. that's I think that is more important than anybody who's like says, yeah, they're okay. That's the worst thing you could have. Right. You want a strong opinion. Like the people, I don't know if you've ever read Private Parts by Howard Stern, but it's it's an amazing book. It's interesting too, like reading that and then listening to Stern now and how much he has evolved as a broadcaster and like a human being. But he talks about how important it is to like elicit a strong emotional response from everybody around you. And I agree with that. Like 100%, I think he's on it with that. I mean, um, you definitely have a strong response, um, which people, if, if people follow your Instagram, they'd know your, your theater, um, yeah. <laughs> that you get and people. It's wild. You bring that up. One of my friends was asking me about listener complaint theater today saying you haven't done one in a long time. And I, and I act actually, I know that I haven't because the thing about the listener complaint theater is you've kind of got to, you got to fish a little bit, you know what I mean? So you get hate mail all the time, but it's how you respond to the hate mail that will get them to write back. And the last year has been pretty negative. So I can honestly say that I have, I have not really tried mm -hmm. to get a good listener complaint theater again in a while, just cause it's just, it's like emotionally exhausting <laughs> so much, you know? And, and it's funny, but I, I just, I'm just kind of like, I'm, and I was, I was saying to my, it was my friend, Brian, and he was asking me about it. And I was like, I just don't, I just don't want to do it right now. And he's like, I get it. I get it. You don't want to wade into the negativity because you get to a point where you're just like, ah, just grow up. Just right. so, yeah. I, I, but I love that bit so much. I think it's hilarious because it's, it's, they always, they always think they're smarter than you. Like always think they're smarter than you. No matter what you say, they're, they know more. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> so um, you said you were working at the Bear in Edmonton. Was that um, your first broadcasting job? No, 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 no. That, 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 I'd been in it for a while at that point, like okay. over five years. Um, it was my first, my first, first, first radio job was doing overnights on an AM country station <laughs> in Nova wow. Scotia. And it was, it was wild. And then I did um, evenings, like part-time evenings at like uh, adult contemporary, like sort of like a CHFI type station sure. in the same, it was the same building. Like they had an AM and an FM signal. And I was working on the AM side and then went to the FM side, which was kind of like a, a promotion. Right. Um, I found out later it's because they just needed somebody to operate the hockey games because they broadcast the Acadia University hockey games on that station. So I did that. And then uh, when I left there, I went to CIGO, uh, which is now 101.5 The Hawk in Port Hawkesbury. And that was like a pop music station. And it was kind of an anomaly uh, because most radio clusters are owned by these big chains, right? This was an independent station owned by one guy who was in the building and I worked for him. His name was Bob McEachern. And I didn't realize how lucky I was to be there. And I had an attitude <laughs> and I got, I got myself fired. I was just an asshole. Like I was like a guy who was in his, I was like 20 years old. I thought I knew it all. I would get told to do something and I'd be like, I don't want to do it. And then I wouldn't do it. And I got fired and I have since made amends with Bob. And when I say make amends, like messaged him to tell him straight up, I screwed up. I was garbage and you were right to fire me. I was the worst. And he's like, he goes, I've never doubted your talent. It was just, you didn't have the maturity that I needed at the time. And he's like, he still follows me on Twitter and Instagram. I, I talk to Bob a lot. And whenever I talk to him, I always start with an apology. Because I, I, I screwed that all up, man. I screwed it all up for myself. And then from there, I went and I worked at this, at like an AM easy listening station 
uh, in Dryden, Ontario. Do you know where Dryden, Ontario is? No. Exactly. <laughs> so it's halfway between Thunder Bay and Winnipeg. And I worked there for two years. And it was, it was the worst station I've ever worked at. Like it was just, it was the darkest point in my life. That was the crucible. Um, Cause I don't know if you watch Letter Kenny. I've seen my brother. Okay, Letter Kenny is shockingly accurate in its portrayal of small town Ontario. Uh, like Northern town, there's the skids, there's the rednecks. It's, it was just like, it was awful for me. Um, but I, and the station was just as bad. There's, and that's not saying I disliked everyone I worked with. I worked with some great people. It was just, there's a lot of people in small town radio that don't have the talent or the drive, more likely just the drive or the will to get to a big market. Mm -hmm. And they treat anybody that does like, somebody to just keep their thumb on you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so that was it was and and to be honest i still had an attitude i was still young <laughs> so i made a lot of i maybe made a lot of these problems for myself but it was the worst and that was when i got to winnipeg mm -hmm. winnipeg was great that's where i became a stunt boy i used that to get a job at the goat in lloyd minster then back to winnipeg full time then edmonton doing evenings eventually to afternoons which got me to toronto that's the whole story. That's the whole wow. chain right there. Wow. Okay. So what um, got you into broadcasting in the first place? Um, so the bear, I was talking with the bear and the, yeah. the, the grunge explosion. <laughs> there was this show uh, on afternoons. Like I loved this guy, Sled Dog Michaels. He was on the morning show. I thought he was really funny, but the sh like that, he was the first guy I really gravitated towards on the station. But as I got, older and would listen to it more in the afternoons there was this show uh with matt mahler and jake daniels were the two guys that hosted it matt it was drive time with matt and jake and i thought they were like the coolest guys in the world and they made me want to do radio but it was never anything that i really thought was a feasible plan mm -hmm. and then i called to request a song and I want to say it was January of 97. I always say it was, I called the request song in January of 97. Uh, and the evening announcer, her name was Goldie Rocks. I called the request Tool Stink Fist. She made fun of me for about <laughs> five minutes on the phone and then told me that The Simpsons was back from commercials and she had to go. Then she hung up on me. And I remember like holding the phone being like, that sounds like the greatest job in the world. She just made fun of me and then was watching the Simpsons. I, this is what I got. That was when I decided that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on the radio just like that. And then I started being like obsessive about like analyzing what I was listening to, who was doing what, what the shifts were and all that stuff. So yeah, that, that was really when I, I always loved it. But that was when I decided that I was going to do it. And it was felt like something so ridiculous and impossible. But you just say it and you'd be like, yeah, I, I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do for life. Because people, people are like, so you're in grade 12 now. Oh, what are you thinking you're going to do? And it's like, ah, just work on the radio. You just throw it out there. And they're like, oh, OK. How are you going to do it? I don't know. I'll figure it all out. I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go. Um, well, with that, I mean, um, what would your advice be for someone who wants to get into broadcasting? Um, let's be honest. Let's be totally blunt. Yeah. The market, the business is changing. Yeah. Now, if we're talking about somebody who's your age, who's younger, mm -hmm. um, I would suggest that they do a podcast and they treat it as a side hustle. And I would encourage them to get a day job and work on the podcast as a side hustle until you can turn your side hustle into your main hustle. Like do a really good podcast. Re That's the thing is like, just cause you're doing it on the side doesn't mean you can't reach out to professionals to do it for a living. Like there's loads of people that work like Amazon's launching a podcasting network. Right, Apple of right. course owns podcasting um, like uh, Gimlet, all these big, podcast like chorus owns a podcast network the curious network like there's so many different ones 
-hmm. And you can be doing it on your own and make contacts with these people and learn from them and figure things out. Like Dark Poutine, which is one, one of the biggest podcasts in the country, is on the Curious Cast Network for Chorus. Mm -hmm. That guy was just doing it as a side hustle and then it took over and got huge. Right. Like all these big podcasts, these big audio dramas were started by people doing it on the side. Mm -hmm. So I write comics. I write comics as a side hustle, hoping that it can one day eclipse my day job salary and I can do it full time. Um, is that happening? No, but I'm no longer paying to make comics. Right. I make money off doing something I really love but I have the financial security of my day job to pay all my bills in the process. Now, of course, my day job is radio, which is something I'm suggesting people try not <laughs> to do right now. And I say that because it's difficult, right? The people, how can I say this? When I was coming into broadcasting in the late 90s, mm -hmm. there was a lot of voice tracking. Voice tracking was becoming the thing and syndication. And all of the jobs that were out there, the big jobs that were owned by the people that had been in those positions for like decades. Right. And it was very, very hard to get in. We're seeing that now once again, because voice tracking kind of went away and now it seems to be coming back. And so again, there's not as many gigs out there as there were. Mm -hmm. So I would always encourage you to have a day job do an amazing podcast, do an amazing, like you could even work part-time in broadcasting and weasel your way in that way as a side hustle. I'm just, I'm very hesitant to encourage anyone to fully engage in this as a full-time career mm -hmm. right now because podcasting is exploding. Right. And if you do a really good, and I'm not talking like you do like a chum cast, like a really well-executed, well-researched, well edited put together professional sounding podcast and then get that into the hands or ears of people that run these podcasting networks sky's the limit man it's it's all in how you, if you treat it like a throwaway thing it's always going to be looked at as a throwaway thing and that was one of the things i learned when my podcast evolved and it went on to the curious cast network because my the original issue zero podcast uh, was like, I would just have people I knew in comics and we just talk about comics. We talk about, or people from a TV show, we talk about the TV show they were on, but then it evolved. And I started like picking a topic or a question and I would script it and I would execute it. And I get, I get interviews, but I would set up the interview to fill in spots in the podcast to make it sound more professional. And that became a lot more work, but it also sounded so much better, you know? So that, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> that's my advice. <laughs> um, um, you, you kind of talked about your path from starting out to getting to Q107. Um, obviously, I think especially over the past decade, radio has really evolved and changed. I mean, it went from like disc jockeys, like putting it on, right? And like WKRP. To a bunch that was a great of, show. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff on a computer. What are some of the biggest changes that you have like personally seen since you started? Syndication is the biggest change that I've seen since I started. When I started out, I feel so old even talking like this. But <laughs> when I started out, uh, my like I said, when I got to Winnipeg, this is like 20 years ago. I was doing overnights live, so I was on air from midnight till 5:30 a.m. Right. That even in Toronto, you're not seeing that anymore. So that is a big change. Um, we used to have like live weekend overnight. Like we had some, when I got to the edge, there was somebody in the studio 24 right. seven. Uh, and now that's just not the case. And I feel like it, the COVID situation has really exacerbated the situation and made it much worse because audience have shrunk because they're not driving revenue has shrunk therefore syndication has become a bigger thing mm -hmm. but now like i do my show in toronto i also have a show in london and in winnipeg and probably in edmonton soon so i don't 
I can't say that I like it, but I understand it. That is the biggest change. So before I even do my show in Toronto on Q107, I've already done shows in three other markets. Right. That is without a doubt the biggest shift. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like that's, that's it right there. Cause the, the thing about playing music digitally and all that stuff that had, was already around even in the late nineties, mm -hmm. people were playing MP4s and MP3s. And the reason they went back to CDs for about two years was because there was, now this is just what I've heard secondhand. This is what I've heard scuttlebutt from radio people. So, take it with a grain of salt but when remember the nap napster exploded and there was all the big lawsuits with napster and all that stuff and then there became a big reaction to digital music in general so if a station was playing music digitally like an mp3 or an mp4 or anything they had to pay a fee a tax to the record companies um and so all the radio stations were like no we're not doing that anymore. We're, we'll just go back to playing music on CDs then. Right. And so what ended up happening was the, the record labels and their associations realized that it was now costing them more money to print and send out CDs with singles because each label like Universal, Sony, BMG, et cetera, they would send out these CDs with their big singles from all their different formats, the rock formats, the punk formats, the, the pop, the the r b all that would be on one cd and there'd be multiple cuts of each song so you could play the edit that fits you because like a song from papa roach was also tracking on a, a pop radio station so there was the pop music edit of that song and they realized that going back to sending out the printing and sending and mailing the cds was more expensive <laughs> so they just went back to digital so that's that was not as big of a change because you're just pressing play or pressing play you're pressing play on a computer or on a cd player it's not it's all the same and it's all like wired into the soundboard so when you hit play you're just going from one button to the next that's the only real difference in the studio and then you pop the cd out like that it's muscle memory like because the way it worked is they came in these carts called denon discs is what it was and you put the cd in the cart that was kind of looked like those old school PC floppy disks and you'd slide it in and then you could like select the song to start at a specific frame. Mm. So certain songs have these really long winded slow intros. So you could speed it up to start right here at this specific point. And then you'd be on air. And then as soon as you press play, it would play from there. So I miss CDs. I think station sounded better with CDs. I'm not even joking because the bit rate and the sample rate on an MP3 is lower mm -hmm. than it is when it's on uh, MP3. And MP3s, a lot of the times, they have a digital tone that's attached to the song that you don't hear, but when you, you're like, you're listening, listening, you can almost hear it. I don't know, but maybe it's just because it's what I do. So I don't know. It's like you talk to a plumber, they can be like, oh, you got different types of pipes in here. It's like, right. this is like <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so with that, obviously, a lot of people, especially in the younger generation, are streaming music on Spotify and yep. pop music. Where do you think radio's headed? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, there was a time where people like, the labels made a big deal about um, home taping, people making mixtapes. Right. That was, it was going to destroy the recording industry. That was 40 years ago. So do I see radio disappearing? No, because radio's strength is that it's local. That is what I believe it's most important thing is, is I, I get so many messages from people that are from Toronto that are living in like Buenos Aires or Australia and they can get a taste of home by one button and then it's there and it's something familiar and radio in its simplicity is you push a button and it's there right. with Spotify there's a few more steps to go through and that's not me bashing Spotify I get a hundred percent why people use it Right. Um, but I also, from a music fan's perspective, am kind of hesitant 
to really support a format like Spotify that pays its artists a pittance. Mm -hmm. Like radio pays fans a, a, like a fee, the SoCan fee. Like every song we play, the band gets a royalty and it's like a hundred times bigger than the royalty that they're getting from like Spotify. Uh, so there's that. I just, the, making a playlist, finding a specific act. And I also will say this, as somebody who uses Spotify in the house on weekends, um, it's, we've all had this moment where you go to like blank band radio on Spotify and you're listening to like three or four songs in a row that all flow really good. And then a song comes on, you're like, what the hell is this? what is what, what does this have to do with any of this and it's and it's like a completely different genre of music just from but it's it's from the same decade so it's got to be the same it's not the same at all so radio is curated by a human being mm -hmm. that is sitting there like going that works that doesn't that works and then they create a playlist built on specific categories and then they go over it and they're like, that doesn't flow into that right. That doesn't flow into that. So the flow is a lot different. And also, if you go on to the one complaint people always have about radio is you play the same songs all the time, which is wild because like when people call in and request songs, they're requesting all the songs that we're still playing. <laughs> um, and then they're like, you never played the songs. Like, dude, I played that three hours ago. But a playlist for us, at Q is about three times the size of a standard radio playlist on a Spotify channel. And I know that because I've seen the numbers. Right. So it's the numbers don't lie. And when you're listening, just look at my hand, it's coming right at the screen. When you're listening to a Spotify thing, you always go to like the same channels. Right. Like everyone does. And, and it's because it's mood. It's like music is like a blanket. And sometimes you just want your blanket. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just want that song that makes you remember what it was like when you didn't have lower back problems all the time. Like, you know, everyone, like, that's just the way it is. Music is like smell in the sense that it just like elicits this primal immediate response right. all the time. Like I can still remember the first time hearing specific songs mm -hmm. and like, it'll never go away. You know, it's wild. So I think radio I, I really see a big shift coming in the sense that you're going to have a lot more niche radio than we are now, uh, where it'll be specific super servicing of a specific demographic. Sure. Like everybody who loves Southern rock will have a Southern rock radio station. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just inevitable in how I see it going. Uh, I don't see announcers going away. In fact, I see announcers doing longer shifts than they used to uh, and being as local, local, local as they possibly can is how I see it going. But I don't know. Uh, that could just be me thinking positively. So do you think um, the fact that it's a person running radio is what it's going to take to maintain an audience? Is yes, 100% I think it will. I think that is the biggest thing that radio has going for it is that mm -hmm. there is a legitimate tactile personal feel to it. And every now and again, you like you listen to an announcer do a break and it's a good announcer frames the music. So they like they, they come on and what they're talking about compliments the music that they're playing in terms of the tone and they're reading the they're reading the room like you don't come on after live lightning crashes and do a wacky break you know because the song is too sad unless you come on and acknowledge it like ugh, what a sad i remember one of my favorite breaks that i ever did was when hosier take me to church was like the biggest goddamn song going like a million hits all the time. And it was a Friday morning at like 8.30 in the summer. And it was sunny. It was already like 25, 26 degrees at like 8.30 in the morning. Like it was a banger of a summer day. And that song came on. And 
I, I turned, the song started playing. I was like, we did a break and that song started playing. And then like, I came back on the air like twice, stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> that is not the song that anyone wants to hear right now. Nobody getting in their car at 8.30 on a Friday morning, looking forward to the weekend when it's sunny and it's beautiful, wants to hear this slow ass, sad bastard music. No, not doing it. Give me something better. And then we went into like the gorillas and I'm like, yes, that's what we want. Play dare by the gorillas. That is the song you want to drive to on a sunny summer morning. That's it right there. Not this move on. We're done. We're done. We're done. So yeah, like those types of things is why is that's the biggest strength that the format has. I think yeah. is that when you're in your car or when you're listening at work, mm -hmm. the person that you're listening to, is in the same place dealing with the same shit you are, you know? Sorry, I swore. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah, you're Okay, right. good. All right. So, yeah, that's it. That is the biggest thing that it has. Right. Um, yeah, I guess I never really thought um, about when people talk on air, them connecting it somehow to the same vibe of the music. I think it's always just been something that never hit me. Like Because sure. if it's good, you don't notice. If it's bad, you notice. Like, sure. Like... <laughs> We've all had those moments where we're like, like we're talking over the Spotify list, man. Like right. I forget was we we listened to a lot of like uh, like jazz and stuff in the house because my mm -hmm. my kids play instruments and my youngest is especially into like jazz piano, and we were listening to a lot of like like Duke Ellington and all that mm -hmm. stuff, and then all of a sudden, the Beach Boys, God only knows, came onto the playlist and amazing song i will always argue that pet sounds by the beach boys could be the most well-produced album in the history of music and recording period but no <laughs> not now that does no that does right. not mix at all at all it's like imagine if you're listening to songs released in 1999 and you go from like rage against the machine to tool and then Eiffel 65 Blue comes on. Right, right. Yeah, like these are all from the same like two year period, but no, <laughs> no. So yeah. Um. So Q and a Seven is always giving away tickets to concerts and events. Not right now, we're not. But normally, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, usually they are. Um. And um. So okay. So what's the inside scoop? Do you get tickets to all the good shows? Um, you know what? Yes, you can get tickets all the time. And when I was younger, I would go to shows like two or three nights of the week. Like I was, you're always out. You're always going to concerts. You're always going to shows. And you're always doing the handshaking. And then you go to these concerts and you meet the bands and you meet the label reps and then you meet the, the A&R guys and you meet all the people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. But then what ends up happening is, is it becomes old hat and you have a family and then you don't want to do those things anymore because you, you like, I would rather go home and hang out and watch my kids doodle around and be wieners than go to a show and watch a bunch of people that are like 15, 20 years younger than me get drunk and make poor decisions. And like, it's just like, eventually you used to be that, but then you like, you grow, like, how old are you right now? I'm 17. So 17, you're going to see all this eventually, like going to, sh uh, it's just not going to be worth it. <laughs> So you don't go to shows as much anymore. And then, so there's a thing called the AMA and I'm going to say this to you and you're going to think that I'm not right, but I'm telling you, I am a hundred percent correct. Okay. You're between the ages of 15 and 25. You have the AMA. Okay. That's the active music age. The music you listen to in that decade mm -hmm. will be the music that you listen to for the rest of your life. And even if that's not the music you're listening to, you'll be listening to newer music or older music that reminds you of that music yeah. between the ages of 15 and 25. No, it's really called the awesome. AMA, the active music age. That is when you are the biggest fan of music you will be in your whole life. And I, I, when I was in broadcasting school and our teacher told us that, I went, no way, man. 
I'm going to listen to new music forever. Well, guess what? <laughs> Dave Bannerman was 100% correct. And I have listened to Tools Lateralis a gazillion times, and I could throw it on now, and I would love every second of that album. Right. It's like, it's just what happens, you know? It's just how it is. What Absolutely. are you going to do? So what do you listen to? Who's your favorite band right now? It's hard to pick one, so give me like like three or four, like the top, like you know. I mean, honestly, a lot of the time I'm listening to the hip. Um, I love Harry Styles. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Like, okay, I remember my cousin, my favorite cousin. Uh, I hope none of my other cousins see that, but my favorite cousin, <laughs> she was like, she was 16, and I was. This is when I was working at the Edge, and she was 16, and. Her and her dad <clears throat> came to visit for like a week and they were staying at my house and um, we we're, we we're on the we we're on the go train with her dad and her and she had she like was coming and visiting from Halifax and she bought some albums and she was showing the albums and my uncle was like, ah, oh, that's no good, that's no good. And then she kind of got like sheepish about the music she was in, and I remember like I just went, dude. You love the music you love. You don't ever be embarrassed about the music you love. You love it because it makes you feel something. And that's precious. Don't ever let anyone tell you not to enjoy music. Doesn't matter what it is. You be proud of what you love. And Corey Taylor of Slipknot had this throwaway line in an interview once. Slipknot's one of my favorite bands, by the way. They're amazing. And Corey Taylor is one of those guys that people love him or they hate him. I think I love his interviews more than I love anything else that he does. And he was doing this interview and somebody asked him, like, what's your guilty pleasure band? He goes, I don't have any guilty pleasures. If I love something, I love something. I don't need to feel guilty about loving country music or pop music or classical music or anything. Music is music. And if it makes you feel something, why well, feel bad about it? Right. That's the problem. And I was just like, 100%, man. If you love Harry Styles, you love Harry Styles. Love Harry if it Styles. makes you feel something, like... Don't ever shut your feelings off, man. Right. There's like people when they they shut their feelings off, they lose something, you know. Do you, have you seen Soul? No, I haven't. Dude, it's Soul I'm like bringing it up, and my parents are like, I don't want to watch a depressing movie right now. It's not depressing, dude. It's not depressing at all. It makes you feel something. Like if right. you're a, I tell everybody who's a music fan, like that. If you've ever like had that moment where you just, you don't even feel like you're present anymore because you're just listening to music and you're somewhere else. Yeah. The opening scene of that movie will hit you in your soul. Like literally no pun intended. It's I, I think I got way more out of that movie than my kids did. I was profoundly influenced by that movie when we watched it. Like I was shook, like literally right. just, haven't had that experience with a movie or a song in in years. It was so good, I'll so good. Watch that. I mean, that like this, the a movie that kind of the same thing for, for me was the movie Almost Famous. Like watching that, like yeah, changed. That came out when I was like at my first radio gig. Oh really? Yeah, man. That's that movie's awesome. It's a great movie. <laughs> so, what's your most memorable concert? Oh, concert. It's hard to pick one because you like different things for different reasons. Right. Um, I always say Wolf Mother was one of the greatest like things I've ever. The uh, Wolf Mother's original lineup when it was just a three piece and tour three piece touring band, and it was the performance was great because of the like the bass player had a full leg cast and he was playing bass with his leg cast. <laughs> And then he was like hobbling around and he swung the like bass over his shoulder and then was on like the Hammond B3 organ. Like, and it just like, then he pulled the bass back on and was up playing again. And it was like, it was so great of a performance to have that fat of a sound with three people. Right. Uh, and the lead singer, Andrew, I think it's Andrew Stockdale. I don't really remember. He's kind of a wiener. I met him. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. It was wow. awful. But he was like playing the the jazz flute during the show. It was just insane. But in terms of spectacle, 
like an over the top spectacle. Um, Muse, um, when they played, it was the tour they did in like 2010. I forget what the name of the album that they were touring on was, but it was, I've never been to a show that was that over the top, sounded so good. Like I've never been at a show that sounded, normally concerts that are really loud don't sound good, if that makes any sense. Like it's just loud and mid tempo, but this, the, the whole show starts, right? So it starts with the whole thing goes black. You see the stage in the center because it's in the round. So stage goes black. And then when it lights up, there's these three towers in the stage that are like 30, 50 feet tall. And they weren't there before. And I was like, how did they get there? And then they all light up and they're meant to look like skyscrapers. And then this clock starts going tick, talk, tick, talk. And it's like, and the crowd is going bananas. And then in the, like the lights of the buildings, you see people walking like down, like in time with all the steps. Yeah. And then the, like you're, and it's just, it's going, it's going. And you can tell it's building to something. It's building to something. Right. And then the lights go whoosh, and they start playing Knights of Sidonia, which is just a banger of a song. And the three of them, one of them are on each tower. And they're all playing like on the top of these goddamn towers. And I'm like, oh my God, this is insane. <laughs> like it was such an amazing experience. And I'm not even, I wouldn't even put Muse in like my top 10 bands, but I was blown away by that tour, like on every possible level. I was just like, this is so good. Like songs that I'm not even that big of a fan of they just have this anthemic vibe to them i loved every second of it that's awesome um thanks to q107 actually i got to go to the roger waters concert and now that'd be a good show awesome like set <laughs> yes this giant flying pig with trump's face on it yeah it was, it was so epic so i love I love when they do stuff on stage with like sets and stuff. I think it really just makes it more of an experience than like. That's the thing is like, you can listen to an album. When you go to a show, you want an experience. I mean, Kiss is one of those bands. I don't think Kiss is very good, but Gene Simmons said, he goes, the most insulting thing you can do as a musician is sit down on stage. And I agree with that. Like you go to like a coffee house performance to see right. someone play an acoustic guitar. That's different. Right, right, right. You go to a show, you want to show, right. you know what I mean? You want an experience. So you, um, you said we briefly touched it. Uh, you write comics. Yes. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? How did that start? I mean, were you always drawing like as a kid? Oh, I can't draw. I'm terrible. Drawer. Well, you know what the fact I used to think that I was a really good drawer and then I, uh, it was in like high school. I just stopped drawing because I started reading a lot of like stuff from image and, they had just these unbelievable artists and right. my art was garbage compared to it. So I gave up on it. And then I kind of drifted away from comics in general because I had no money. But when I got back to Edmonton, uh, I started going to Happy Harbor again. And um, I started like falling in love with comics again. And it was why the last man was the comic that really did it. But, and I loved why the last man, I thought it was really good. Uh, but it, because it was Vertigo, there was always advertisements for other Vertigo books. And there's this Vertigo comic called 100 Bullets, which is like a super crime noir story from, oh, God, uh, Brian Azzarello and Eduardo Rizzo are the two creators on that book. And it is, I was like shocked at how good it was. It made me fall in love with comics again. And then I started writing comics and when I got to Toronto, I was, I was on the air and I, my profile photo on the station, I was wearing a blue lantern shirt from DC comics and Adam Gorham, who is like a, a rising star in comics. He's a big name now, but he's only getting bigger. Mm -hmm. He had just dropped his very first book and he emailed me asking if I wanted to like, if I'd be willing to like read his book, talk about it or anything. And I emailed back being like, would you want to make a comic with me? 
And so then we started making comics and we did this story called Teuton, uh, which is based on uh, the Northern Crusades and brought in Lithuanian mythology. And mm. it was like historical fantasy, I guess would be the genre that you could call it. And it was wild and it was out there and we worked on it for like three years. And that was really the end. And then from there, I did a comic called The Fourth Planet with this artist, Miko Maciejic. And that comic itself was like a, like a sci-fi story that was kind of inspired by uh, my love of Battlestar Galactica. And then I did a bunch of pitches and I did like small indie comic work and like anthology work, which is where everyone's writing a short story and you're contributing to that. But 2020 was a frustrating year for me because leading into 2020, I had signed a bunch of deals with, uh, various imprints. I had three books that were ready to go, like three comics that were supposed to drop, supposed to launch. And when 2020 hit and then Diamond Distributing like said, no, the comic book industry like retracted and everything I had like imploded. Right. So then I, I was very upset, very frustrated. But fortunately, right at the end of this year, like last year, right at the end of uh, 2020, we signed a deal with uh, Shadowline and Image to do a book called Dead Romans, which is, it's based on uh, an incident in the Roman Empire. It's the biggest defeat that they ever took. Not the biggest defeat, but the most, it, it changed the world. Literally, it changed the world. Uh, and it was called, it's the Battle of Tudorburg Forest. And it's a fascinating, point in history where this dude Arminius who was a Roman who was a German prince taken prisoner by the Romans and raised in Rome went back to Germania and was meant to be like a liaison between the empire and the German tribes and in secret over two years he united like 20 tribes that all hated each other and they were all united in secret and they ambushed the Roman empire and massacred like 40,000 people over the course of like four days and drove the Romans out of Germania permanently. And it's, it's, a, it's a really dark story and it's really over the top, but it's really cool. And the artist, Nick Marankovich has put together some unbelievable visuals for it. I'm pretty stoked for that one to drop. So you, you kind of do a bit of everything, I mean, in this industry, because you, you write comics and you also do some voice acting. Um, yeah, I did super science friends. I'd like yeah. to do more voice acting, but it's a very close knit community and very hard to get into. So do you have like a broadcasting voice that you use when you're on air. No, this is it. This is all I got. This is all I got. This is it. And what the, that actually was a problem when I started. Cause when I started, it was still the big voice era. Hey brother, what's going on? You know, like all those guys were still around. There's still a few out there, but for the most part, like there's no radio voice anymore. It's just like a right. human voice. You know, it's kind of like how on social media, people doing like ultra clean, unrelatable content doesn't get the traction that slightly dirty, slightly legitimate right. human interaction does. It's just, nobody wants to watch something that's just better than them all the time right. you know <laughs> so usually when i have like artists on with instruments and such i have them like do a little showcase so i was thinking with you could you show us some of your tattoos and kind of explain what they oh, are <laughs> what no i can't my all my color stuff is all like on my under my pants i can't take my pants off that's inappropriate <laughs> um but like there's a lot of stuff on here my my so the way i've got it all broken down is my left leg is like villains and my right leg is predominantly good guys but it's all superheroes um so there's there's uh galactus the silver surfer who's my favorite superhero um thor is fighting the green lantern which is a good throwdown uh there's omniman from invincible which is a show that's about to drop on amazon the guy who created The Walking Dead, Robert Kirkman, created this superhero comic called Invincible, which I always say is the best superhero comic ever. Sure. Um, just because it had a it had a finite run, it didn't just go on forever. It was one run. Right. 
And the premise is like, uh, there's this guy, his name's Mark Grayson, and his dad secretly is Omniman, who's like the Superman of their world. And his dad tells him, son, the day is going to come when you'll get your superpowers. And when that happens, you need to come to me so I can teach you how to use them properly. And so he's working at like a McDonald's called Burger World. And he's taking out the trash one night and he goes to throw the garbage into the garbage can and just throws it. And then the garbage bag is gone. And he's like, yes. So that's when he becomes invincible and he gets his superpowers. And it is just the best superhero comic because it runs every gambit of like time travel, interdimensional stuff, aliens, cosmic travel, alien empires. It's amazing. And then it, it like, you follow the main character as he goes over 10 years from being a kid in high school to being a guy who has a baby with another superhero that he met when he was younger. It's, it's fascinating. It's really, really good. And everyone was going nuts about the walking dead and I liked the walking dead, but they were coming at it around the same time. Mm -hmm. And I was firmly in camp invincible way, way better. Than the walking dead cool that like your clothes don't like the colors don't like no nah, i don't care <laughs> one time i was at, i was at like a drive through and the girl in the drive through was like i love your leggings where did you get those and i'm like my mom <laughs> <laughs> sorry they're that's my leg yeah so that's the yeah i, I it's always people think i'm wearing leggings is what ends <laughs> up happening that's great um, I have one last question before we play like a quick game Perfect. and I think it's probably like the heaviest hitting question. All right. Um, now that it's more popular, um, do you still hate high waisted jeans? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And no, it's, I, dude, there was a Twitter thing about high waisted jeans that I got dragged into. <laughs> and the thing was that I said, high-waisted jeans will always remind me of my mom picking me up from Little League practice. And I used a gif from a, from a sketch on Saturday Night Live called Mom Jeans. And there was a bit, and what's funny about that bit was that those jeans that they're wearing in Mom Jeans became the popular jeans right. for people to wear. <laughs> and so somebody i and this is what was wild is somebody i've never even met k thanks by me they were like they're the jeans that fit my body type k thanks bye and it was just like a k thanks by aggressive aggressive you don't you don't k thanks by someone you've never met before <laughs> unless they're saying something like legitimately mean and i kind of got dragged a bit for it and it was it turned into this thing about me telling women how to dress. And I was like, at no point did I say anything about anyone. It was just saying my mom wore those jeans when I was like 12 years old. How is that bad? I'm not being mean. I say dress however makes you feel comfortable, but don't expect everyone to think that you're like a fashionista. Like, and why do you care what other people think anyways? Like, are you comfortable? Dude, I go to the grocery store in sweatpants. I don't care. I, I wear a fanny pack sometimes. I don't care. I wear cargo shorts. Again, I don't care. They're comfortable. Cargo shorts are like the ultimate puttering around the yard on a weekend's clothing. I got pockets. I can put stuff in them. I can carry stuff around. I got my garden shears in this pocket. I pull them out, do some pruning, put that. Oh, my cell phone's over here. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, okay. Got my wallet. Got everything. I need to run to the store. I don't need to stop inside. I just get in the car and I go. Who cares? But I think this is what's happening. The high-waisted skinny jeans are gone because the I was reading that your generation is bringing back bootcut jeans. You're the young cool one. You're supposed to. What is with that expression? So you don't like bootcut jeans, straight leg boot. They're so comfortable. They're like the sweatpants of denim. It's I mean, amazing. It's so uncomfortable. I'm like, why is it like not sticking to my leg? Yeah, I don't want that. I grew up in the '90s, and what's wild is so my hair. I got like it's longer <laughs> and center part. Someone's like, that's the center part. That's like the new trendy hairstyle. I was like, dude, 
I literally had, my hair was exactly like this from 1994 <laughs> to 1996. Like this was literally what my hair looked like. It was this long. It was cut the same exact same way. So the boot cut jeans were a 90s thing. I think that's going to come back to you. Wait and see. And I'm stoked because I still have jeans from that era that I'm going to break out. <laughs> Period. <laughs> All right. So it's game time. So All right. it is time to play what I'm calling quick, quick quickie questions. Okay. So good. I have a series of questions and I'll give you 35 seconds to answer them all. That's a lot of time. I'm ready. Well, well, well. Oh, 35 seconds to do all of them? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, good. First, question. first question. That's a lot. I can go. We're good. All right. Let me not 35 minutes, 35 seconds. Uh, here we go. Okay. 35 seconds on the clock. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Darth Vader or Kylo Ren? Darth Vader. R2-D2 or BB-8? R2-D2. Mountains or oceans? Mountains. Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. Rush or the hip? The hip. Pizza or poutine? Pizza. Spring or fall? Fall. Futurama or Family Guy? Futurama. TV or radio? Working or watching? Watching. Radio. Cinderella or Belle? Cinderella. Batman or Superman? Superman. Ooh. I want to go back and change uh, Cinderella to Belle. Belle way better okay. than Cinderella. And I'm let's, changing. Let's, I'll finish off the questions though, because there's okay. some ones left. Uh, Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. And what's brown and sticky? Uh, wet brown sugar. A, a stick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. wet brown sugar is also sticky. Sort of. <laughs> That's true. Why is that what came to your mind? I don't know, because I had oatmeal with my kids today and I put brown sugar in it. <laughs> That's so odd. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on today. I was so excited to have you on and I thought Awesome, it was man. Just I emailed you and I was like, he's never going to respond, but you responded like very quickly. <laughs> because you emailed me at the right time. Um, I always clean my email out for the day between four and six and you emailed me like around four 30. Yeah. So it popped in right at the top of the list. And so then I went back up to the top, like, oh, yep, yeah, sure. No problem. What do you need? Cause the thing is, is I always have this idea that <clears throat> like if somebody's a young broadcaster or somebody interested in broadcasting and is young, they could wind up being my boss one day and you don't ever want to be like the guy who doesn't give someone the time of day because they're not of use to you at the time. Right. That's bad. That's bad juju. That's bad juju. You always help everybody out whenever you're in a situation to help anybody out. That's like the idea of paying it forward. Right. So there's, there's so many broadcasters in this country right now, TV and radio that always say that, I gave them their first break that like, I listened to their tape. I got back to them and I influenced them when they were starting out. And I always say it's all selfish because one day I'll be on, I'll be washed up and I'll need a hand and I'll have a lot of people I can reach out to. <laughs> I'm only doing it in the long run. I'm just doing it for me. It's a very <laughs> selfish thing. It's very selfish to be selfless when you think about it. <laughs> I guess, I guess it's kind of true. I can't it wait is. to be your boss one day. That'll be one day you can be my boss. <laughs> Just remember, I was very nice. I'll keep that in mind. All right. Have a good one. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you want to be notified every time I upload a new video, hit that bell icon. And don't forget to keep dreaming big.